There are two types of Pokemon fans. People who play the main series games when a new one releases, then there's the people who never shut up about Pokemon Mystery Dungeon. I played the first Mystery Dungeon games when they came out and liked them a lot. We also beat the first one as an intended on the channel, but didn't really care that much enough to play any of the follow-up Mystery Dungeon games, even though I've heard good things about them, and they have a very passionate fanbase. The second games of the Pokemon Mystery Dungeon series were Explorers of Time and Explorers of Darkness, which are basically the same game. I happen to have a copy of Explorers of Time that I got years ago when GameStop was practically giving their DS games away, as nowadays this game fetches for at least double of what I paid for it. Since I haven't played this game before, I also managed to get the official strategy guide to help us play through this game. This is the first Nintendo intended video on a game that I haven't played before, and if you're new here, one thing we like to do on this channel is play games by following strategy guides like this one as closely as possible, and ignoring any prior knowledge I might have on these games. Some have better results than others, and in the case of this one, we start out with two cool mini posters at the start for each version, a recommended path, and then the world of Mystery Dungeon. This section outlines how to play the game, what Mystery Dungeon is all about, and to arrest that Pokemon. I wonder what Magnezone did wrong. For Treasure Town, the main hub of the game, we have a few shops and other places to access, but this time we have Duskull managing the bank and Marowak managing the dojo. I guess Persian and Makuhita got fired. Or maybe they're two of the Pokemon that got arrested with Magnezone. It does detail some things I didn't know from the first game, like how each Pokemon has a set amount of stars on your team and you can't have more than six stars on your team. And then it shows how to build a balanced rescue team to strike first, strike hard, and show no mercy in combat. Nothing else too interesting or funny here, since I'm sure most of you guys watching this video are already familiar with the gameplay of Mystery Dungeon. On the back cover, it says, it's time to face the darkness, to include both versions, rather clever, then to check out the 491 Pokemon, even though 493 existed at this time, so I wonder which two Pokemon are excluded, and then the US price and Canadian price. No Australian price, which is unusual for these guides, but maybe if I do this, you Australians can understand this guide a bit better. This then takes us to the story part of the guide, meaning we can finally load up a new game on Explorers of Time and beat it exactly how Nintendo intended. First, we have to do an aura test, and I got Turtwig. For my partner, I picked Cyndaquil, so we have different types, and Cyndaquil's just cute. And then we have to help Cyndaquil get its treasure back from this evil Zubat and coughing. Here the guide has a general outline with a short description for each chapter, but then later on, it has at least a page or two to fully detail each dungeon a bit more. Kind of a weird way to do it, since there's gonna be a lot of flipping back and forth. For chapter one, a storm at sea, Cyndaquil finds us and we have no idea how we got here. We're apparently a human that got turned into a Pokemon, and then Coughing and Zubat appear to steal Cyndaquil's treasure. Not sure why he was just carrying around this important priceless treasure. We have to chase it down through the beach cave. This cave acts like a tutorial explaining to us how to move, attack, and navigate the dungeons. It was easy enough, and once we reach the top, we fight Coughing and Zubat. It says to focus down Zubat first since it's weaker, and I tried to do that, but my partner just completely destroyed Coughing. So Coughing went down first, but either way, we secured the treasure. Chapter 2 is when things get a bit weird, if they weren't weird already, as we have to form our own rescue team. This works differently than the first Mystery Dungeon games, as now we have to go to Wigglytuff's guild to make our own rescue team, which is basically all under Wigglytuff. We learn a lot about this area, meet Wigglytuff's right-hand Pokemon Chatot, and apparently learn that the flow of time is being distorted. I don't really know what that means yet, but I guess it does tie in with the title of the game, as the title of the game is Explorers of Time. We have our own room here too, but first we have to set out on an easy task to retrieve Spoing's Stolen Pearl. The guy in here mentions how we should have the orange bow in our treasure bag too, which can help us out on our journey, but I only have a sky blue one, not an orange one. So I wonder if the orange one is exclusive to the other version of the game. The dungeon was easy enough, and there was no boss at the end. We get a reward of a whopping 2,000 Pokecoins, but then Chowdot takes the gill's cut, leaving us with only 200 Pokecoins. This seems rather unfair, since we did do all of the work, but our partner Cyndaquil is happy to just be on a rescue team. The next day, we explore Treasure Town a bit more and meet this cute little Azuril buying some apples from the Kecleon shop. 
He drowsy then appears and kidnaps Azurul for some reason, meaning we have to go save it. This dungeon was a lot harder than the previous ones, but we learn how to use actual moves as opposed to our default attack that we can use by pressing A, which is a rather weak move. The guide also details a bit about what each Pokemon in each dungeon does, and in this case there's a Doduo with quick attack that goes across two spaces, Spinarak's scary face, and Nidorina's poison point which of course poisons us. When we finally reach the top, the guide recommends that we use a Stun Seed to battle the Strowsy, and hey, what's Stun Seed backwards? The fight against Strowsy went by in two shakes of a lamb's tail, and once we're turning home, we learn a lot more about what's going on in this world. We also realize that we can apparently see the future since we had some visions of Drowsy kidnapping Azuril before it happened, which I'm sure will be a major plot point later on in the game. We then learn about Time Gears, which are responsible for keeping time steady in different parts of the world, and Grovile is running around trying to steal them. This makes Grovile look like the enemy, and I'm sure we'll have a run-in with Grovile later on. Our next task is Chapter 4, The Gatekeepers, but we have to do some side missions first to unlock it. Just like in the first game, it expects you to do some side missions here and there to level up and build the world out a bit more. Since the dungeon layouts are random each time, it isn't as repetitive as it could be, but it does still get annoying sometimes going through the same dungeons multiple times. After completing about 5 side missions, we can start Chapter 4, where we take over Diglett's security job. The way this worked is we stand underground and have to tell which Pokemon's footprint we are looking up at. The lounger then determines if we should let them in or not. A rather complicated security system, but I guess it works. From here we do more side missions which include rounding up some outlaws. This is new to this version of the game, but outlaws are Pokemon that we have to track down and fight, and then we arrest them for a reward. This then opens up Chapter 5, the first official exploration. Chatot sends you and your partner to investigate the waterfall east of Treasure Town. You can try to approach, but the current is so strong that you can't get close. At that moment, you get a vision of someone jumping through the waterfall into the space beyond. You and your ever-willing partner leap into the waterfall and find a sprawling cave behind it. Apparently this waterfall holds some sort of secret, at least according to Chatot. Chimeco back at the guild recently gave us the ability to recruit team members, and the guide says to form a posse, but we go through the whole dungeon, and nobody wants to be a part of Team Subscribe with us in Cyndaquil. But you know, if you want to be part of Team Subscribe, you can just do that by hitting that subscribe button. At the top, we see the secret gem that we then touch, then have a vision of a shadow that looks a lot like Wigglytuff touching that same gem too. I don't know if we're looking in the future or the past here, and I'm not sure if I mentioned this earlier, but time is standing still for us now, and for some reason our Turtwig can see into the future. I don't really know what time standing still really means for us since we can still go to sleep and everything and it appears to be nighttime outside when we sleep, but it is a Pokemon Mystery Dungeon game, the story doesn't have to make any sense. Eventually we push the gem in and a waterfall comes and takes us away and pushes us all the way to Torkoal's hot spring. We then return home and discuss what happened with Cyndaquil who mentions that he also wants to find the secret of his relic fragment that Zubat tried to steal earlier in the game that is probably going to be a very important plot point towards the end of the game and it wouldn't surprise me if we see a lot more about it soon. The next day we meet Team Skull, no not that Team Skull, this Team Skull which happens to be the Zubat and Coffin we battled in the very first mission. They're part of the guild now too, nothing suspicious about letting them in the guild, and later on we meet the Team Skull leader, your boy Skunk Tank. Wigglytuff and Shoutout then tell us about a plan for a grand expedition, and if we want to join them we need to bring them the perfect apples since Team Skull ate all of our food and we're low on surprise. Thanks Team Skull. While preparing for this expedition we managed to recruit an Anorith finally. It's a low level but I'll take any recruits we can get. But the apple dungeon was pretty difficult overall since we have to hack through 12 floors, and all these Butterfreeze keep poisoning us. After hacking through the apple woods, we meet Team Skull at the top who steal apples from us, make us look bad in front of Chatot who then tells us we're a failure and that we can't go on the expedition now. Wigglytuff is not happy with us to say the least, but then out of nowhere Team Skull come with the apples to try to get a Wigglytuff's good side and give them some apples. After we complete the apple woods, we have to do a few side jobs to unlock the next area which is the side path. I somehow missed this for the first couple of dungeons, but it shows the conditions we have to meet to access each new area. 
I could have really used a guide like this when I first played through the original Mystery Dungeon game since I'd get stuck and confused a lot, but overall I'm still having a lot of fun with this game, more than I anticipated before going into it. And although the guide doesn't detail every little thing and we aren't really showing it that much in the video, it still does a pretty good job of guiding us along. Bidoof's team then consoles us after Chada yelled at us and gives us some of their food since part of our punishment for not getting the apples was we had to skip dinner. We then see Grovile again in a That's So Raven-esque vision, and then when the day comes to pick which members of the guild will be on the expedition, Chada just lets the entire guild go, including us. I didn't really expect that, well actually I did since I read ahead of the guide a little bit and it said that we go on the expedition anyway, but part of the expedition includes a few different dungeons that then lead us to a camp, which then leads us to the big expedition, because Wigglytuff and Chata think they have something over there that can help us figure out why time stands still now. After the side pass, we have the Craggy Coast, and the guide here says, Craggy Coast has huge floors and lots of tiny rooms and a spaghetti-like matrix of crisscrossing paths. Now, I just want to interject here. Mystery Dungeon dungeons are random for every single game, and mine wasn't that spaghetti-like. Hunger will be a problem as you make your way around. Take steps to minimize hunger by bringing a lot of apples with you and by using lots of diagonal movement. You can also cut corners on unwalled paths. After that, we have a shorter dungeon in the rock path and then make it to chapter 8, which is called Groudon's Heart. Around here, we also learn that Uxie might be responsible for our visions, then prepare for the steam cave where Groudon lies, and I'm a bit surprised at how many legendaries are being referenced at not even the halfway point of the game. Before we can challenge Groudon's dungeon, we have to go through the forest path and the foggy forest first. The walkthrough technique for the Foggy Forest says to avoid using Electric-type Pokemon because of all the Ground-type Pokemon here, and if your hero is Electric-type like Pikachu, to make use of projectile items to strike enemies before they get close to you. These two dungeons are just the typical filler dungeons before the main dungeon being the Steam Cave. Prior to entering it, we learn that there is a secret in the Fogbound Lake too, then Cyndaquil finds this weird red gem that is totally unrelated to this secret, I'm assuming. We eventually find this weird Groudon statue in the fog, although we don't know it's a Groudon yet, then upon touching it we get another vision, and it turns out that gem Cyndaquil found can be put into the statue to remove the surrounding fog. This reveals a majestic floating island, and also reveals that Team Skull were lurking in the fog. Wigglytuff shows up just in time, which stops Team Skull from attacking us, but after we leave, Team Skull makes a play at Wigglytuff. This then starts Chapter 9, The Mystery of Fogbound Lake. The fog has lifted and you press ahead to the newly visible Steam Cave. Suddenly, a great roar reverberates through the air. You and your partner quake at the sound of a Pokemon like none you've heard before. But you're determined to meet Uxie and find out the secret of your missing memory. You go to the peak, only to find your way blocked by the legendary Pokemon Groudon, large as life. When we reach the end of the Steam Cave, we see Groudon, who is less than happy to see us, to say the least, and then it challenges us to a battle. The guide suggests that we use Stun Seeds or Sleep Seeds on Groudon, and to also use grass or ice type moves to deal 1.4 times damage. Yeah, the multipliers in Mystery Dungeon are weird like that. Groudon goes down easier than I expected, but it turns out that Uxie created a fake Groudon to fight us, and Wigglytuff was able to avoid an attack from Team Skull. The other guild members then rush to our aid, as Uxie reveals to us that it can alter people's memories and make whoever stumbles across the Foulspout Lake forget they were even here, so they can protect the time gear that is located here. We then tell Uxie our story of us being a human and having these weird visions, but Uxie is not responsible for that either. Now that our expedition is complete and we learn that there is a time seal being guarded by Uxie, we return home and things are back to normal. For one day. This then starts Chapter 10 where we meet Duskinar, a famous Pokemon explorer who came to talk to Wigglytuff. While this is happening, we learn that Azuril lost its water float in the Amp Plains and we have to go find it. We then have another vision of Grovile stealing the Time Seal from Ant Plains, and then you guessed it, the Time Seal actually gets stolen. For the Ant Plains, it says, bring back Azuril's water float. Head to Ant Plains and bring back the stolen water float. In keeping with the name, Ant Plains is teeming with Electric-type Pokemon. Paralysis is something you'll have to deal with pretty often, so make sure you have plenty of Paralysis Healing Heal Seeds and Cherry Berries. Use Gravel Rocks, Iron Spikes, and other thrown items to help you defeat the enemy Pokemon before they get too close. This all leads to a fight against Luxray and the Luxio crew, and there's one Luxray and like 10 Luxios. And also this Elecate we recruited while going through the Ant Plains. 
The guide does suggest ground type moves like Geodude for this fight, but I didn't read that part until after I got to Luxray, so it's too late for us to go back and recruit a Geodude. But they were at least easier than I thought, and we lay waste to them pretty quickly. When we return home, we tell Dustnar about our situation with the visions and all that, who seems to be the only Pokemon that somewhat understands what we're talking about. This then starts Chapter 11 with Grovile, the Thief. We don't meet Grovile just yet though, as we have to go to the Northern Desert first. There's apparently a Time Gear here that we need to get before Grovile gets here. The guy says to bring lots of apples, since you can only find grimy food here which can poison you. And then another paragraph in this section titled Out of the Storm that says, 6th floor, 10th floor, and 11th floor all contain the Sandstorm weather condition. In Sandstorm, all Pokemon except Rock, Ground, and Steel types take 3 damage every 10 turns. The enemies here are mostly Rock, Ground, and Steel types, so it's a huge disadvantage for you. When you walk around with low HP, you're in danger of passing out before you realize it. Find the stairs and make it to the next floor, post haste. While taking 3 damage every 10 steps sounds terrible, and it was annoying since it took a lot of time out of this mission, you also heal with each step you take. So you would really take 3 damage, and then heal 2 damage, then take 3 damage to effectively just take 1 damage every 10 turns, which wasn't too bad. There were Tyranitars here though, which were very scary because they have Dark Pulse, which hits every tile around them and does a lot of damage. Luckily, we learned Mega Drain around here to do a lot more damage to Tyranitar, but I can imagine this being very difficult if you don't have anything to hit Tyranitar for super effective damage. When we reach the end of the dungeon, we see a lot of Quicksand and have to return empty-handed. We then return to that same Quicksand and go into it, revealing that the Quicksand Cave is under the Quicksand, who would have thought, and this is where Mesprit lies. When we reach the top, or rather the bottom since we're going underground here, we see Mesprit, who expects us to steal the time gear, but after defeating Mesprit in battle, we meet Grovile, who comes in and steals the time seal from under us. We have to evacuate immediately, since time in the surrounding area will cause us all to freeze in place. After returning to the guild, we learn of another Pokemon in Azelf that is protecting a different time gear. We have another vision and see Grovile stealing this time gear too. But the guild members raise a good point that some of these missions could be glimpses into the past and not just glimpses into the future, although we were able to deduce that this particular vision was definitely in the future, so I wonder if we'll have visions in the past coming up soon. Time for chapter 12, titled The Only Option, which says chase Grovile to Crystal Lake. Duskinar says it has a lead on Grovile's whereabouts. Apparently, Azelf is protecting the time gear, so everyone heads to Crystal Cave. But you arrive at Crystal Cave, crossing too late. Grovile has defeated Azelf and is at that moment stealing the time gear. Before we reach Grovile, we have to get through the Crystal Cave, which was easy enough, but at the end we see these three giant colored crystals. If we interact with the crystals, they change colors, and the guide shows us how to change them all to the right color, which then opens up the Crystal Crossing Dungeon, where Azelf lies protecting the time gear. The dungeon has water that water type Pokemon or Pokemon with Levitate like our Carnivine can go through. When we reach the end, we finally get to have our showdown with Grovile. I throw a stun seat at it and teach Rhydon a poison type move and poison jab as the guide suggested both of those things, then hammer away at Grovile to defeat it. Dustnar then comes to help Azelf and catch Grovile, where it is revealed that these two know each other somehow. Grovile ends up getting away without the time gear at least, which then starts chapter 13, titled Duskinar's Secret. Here is when Dustnar tells us that Grovile is a fugitive from the future who went back in time to steal all the time gears to destroy the world and plummet it into darkness. Dustnar then reveals that it is also from the future and came back just to stop Grovile from changing the future. This chapter didn't have any key dungeons or anything like that and was mostly dialogue, leading us into chapter 14 titled Into the Future. Things take a weird turn here, as when Dustnar finally catches Grovile and tries to return to the future, he grabs us and our partner Cyndaquil and forces us into the future with them as well. In the future, time stands still, and we see that Dustnar is working with a Dialga, and we are a prisoner along with Grovile for trying to alter the future, probably since we can see into the future. We're forced to work with Grovile at this point as there's no other option, and thanks to Grovile's plan, we manage to escape, fleeing Duskinar's jail and the Sableyes that were holding us hostage. There's only one direction to run, and this leads us to the Chasm Cave. Here there are no walls, and Pokemon can just fly around this place. And the walkthrough technique says take advantage of the lack of walls to attack from across a distance. There are no floors in the Chasm Cave. 
This means that straight line attacks like Psy Wave can hit enemies in other rooms and corridors. It also means that Pokemon with the air terrain ability like Drift Loon and Drift Limb can come at you from anywhere when you're least expecting it. To counter this, you'll need to use the lack of walls to your advantage. Throw items like sticks or iron spikes to damage enemies from afar. The next dungeon is the Dark Hill, which coincidentally the guide suggests dark type Pokemon moves for it since most of the Pokemon here are weak to dark types. Churchwig has Bite for this, which is great, but we also have Mega Drain, which has been the best move for us by far. It does pretty decent damage to just about everything and heals us as well, so we don't have to rely on healing items like Ornberries nearly as much. When we reach the top of the Dark Hill, we have another vision of Grovile, then see a Spear Tomb that defeated Grovile. We then challenge the Spear Tomb and throw a Stun Seed at it to save Grovile. Grovile then tells us about the future and how Dialga, the Pokemon that rules time, basically has an identity crisis since if time is standing still, there isn't much for Dialga to do. However, if time is standing still, Dialga will exist forever because there's no time to move. I, I was a little confused at that part too and I don't know if I got that right. This caused him to revert into Primal Dialga, who now wants time to stand still. At least that's what I got out of all of this. Grovile then reveals that he really went back in time to save the future and not to end the world as he wants to continue the flow of time, and that Dusnar betrayed us and is really working for Primal Dialga and lied to us this whole time. We now have to help Grovile go back in time to save the time gears and assemble them all at the Temperance Tower, but we first need to find Celebi who can help us send us back in time. This then starts Chapter 15, The Secret of the Planet's Paralysis. We have to find Celebi after going through the Dusk Forest. This leads us to the Celebi, who is shiny for some reason, and decides to help us get back into the past, or back to the present, rather, since we're stuck in the future. In order to go back in time, we have to get to the Passage of Time, which is at the end of the Deep Dusk Forest. This time, Celebi joins us alongside this dungeon with Grovile, making our team pretty powerful. But once we arrive at the Passage of Time, Dusnar and some Sableyes ambush us. In this exchange, we learn that Grovile went back in time with a partner originally, and wants to go back into the past to not only save the world, but also find his lost partner. Then in some weird twist, it turns out that we are actually Grovile's partner, but we got amnesia and were turned into a Pokemon somehow, and apparently no other humans exist. As for the visions to the future that we've been having, that's just some weird power we possess that is active whenever we are near a time gear. Don't really know how we got that power, but with the help of Celebi, we're able to get away from Dusknar and go back in time, but Celebi has to stay behind to hold off Dusknar. This starts Chapter 16, A New Dawn, where we realize that there is another Time Gear in Treasure Town and go to the Tree Shroud Forest to locate it. Time is still messed up in the past though because of Dusknar, even though the Time Gears were returned. We now have to carry out Grovile's original goal of collecting all the Time Gears and bringing them to Temporal Tower to properly restore time. At this point, a ton of dialogue triggers where we learned about a hidden land we have to go to but can't access it yet because we have to travel across water to get there somehow, and it leads into Chapter 17, The Guild's Crew. Now that you and your partner know the world is inching ever closer to paralysis, it's time to find the hidden land where Temporal Tower is located. You spill to all your friends in the guild. At Wigglytuff's suggestion, you talk to Torkoal, the elder at the hot spring. It tells you that something needs to be done before you can find the hidden land, and that something has to do with the mysterious pattern on your partner's treasure. Wigglytuff and Shoutout know a place they've seen that pattern before, which happens to be the Brine Lake where we're about to go to. It also turns out that that same relic fragment Cynical found at the start of the game is very important for restoring time because it acts sort of like a key, and the fragment actually chose Cynical to find it for a reason we'll probably learn soon. This then takes us to chapter 18 titled Lapras. Wonder if Lapras will help us with the water travel situation. But first we have to go through the Brine Cave with the help of Chatot. At the end, we see Team Skull who were taken out by Kabutops and his friends. And Team Skull starts to warm up to us now and be a bit less mean. Kabutops was easy enough to take care of with our Mega Drains, although Kabutops did completely destroy Chatot before the fight even started. Wigglytuff then tells us about how he and Shadot fought this Kabutops before and met a Lapras after which is willing to help us cross the sea into the Hidden Land. This then begins Chapter 19, To the Hidden Land. We need to go to the Hidden Land to reach the Rainbow Starship, which will then take us to Dialga. It just so happens that Cyndaquil's Relic Fragment is the key to open the Rainbow Starship, but before we can get access to it, we are ambushed by Dusknar again. The guide suggests we use a Sleep Seed on Dusknar, which it does for most boss fights, and to use spread moves like Discharge to hit nearby Sableyes, but we don't have access to any of those moves right now. Upon defeating Dusknar, it opens its mouth on its stomach and tries to attack us with a last-ditch effort, 
but with the help of Grovi, we all attack its stomach at the same time to finish off Dusknar for good. Dusknar tries to then tell us that if we go through with the plan of fixing the time flow, that it will also change the future, meaning that us and Grovile will cease to exist since that future no longer exists. Cyndaquil wasn't around to hear that, but we decide to go through with this plan anyway since if we don't, both the future and the present are doomed. To stop Dusknar for good, Grovile decides to grab Dusknar and jump into the portal to the future with it, which will shortly cease to exist. A very noble cause for a Pokemon that started out as a villain and sacrificed it all so its old friend and its old friend's new friend can survive. While that was all happening, Cyndaquil opens the Rainbow Stone ship, which takes us to the Temporal Tower and begins the final chapter, The Last Adventure. At last, the showdown with Primal Dialga. You and your partner climb the crumbling Temporal Tower and confront Primal Dialga at the Temporal Pinnacle. Primal Dialga has lost all reason and self-control and won't listen to a word you say. You and your partner muster up all the strength to take down Primal Dialga. You're fighting to prevent the world's paralysis and to defend peace in the world. The Temporal Tower is a very large dungeon where Dialga sits at the top and where the time gears are supposed to rest. The dungeon took a while to get through and then for the fight against Dialga, the guy says fighting and ground type moves cause 1.4 times their normal rate of damage against Primal Dialga. Primal Dialga's Roar of Time is an incredibly powerful move. Throw a Sleep Seed or an XIC seed to buy yourself a few turns. Primal Dialga is incredibly strong and a lot of luck is needed to get through this fight, but at least Cynical has Dig and Flamethrower to hit Dialga very hard. After a few attempts, we finally defeat Primal Dialga and the credits begin to roll, meaning we beat Pokemon Mystery Dungeon Explorers of Time how Nintendo intended. In the post-credits, it shows Cyndaquil and the rest of the guild a few months later, with Cyndaquil going back to the beach to remember where his rescue journey team began and where he found us. Suddenly, Dialga decides to grant Cyndaquil's wish for us to return to his world, and we appear on the beach in front of Cyndaquil like the time we first met. It doesn't make too much sense in the context of the story since we technically disappeared for a few months as our timeline doesn't exist anymore, and we never really got too many answers about what happened to the future as a whole or why we just aren't human anymore, and if our amnesia was ever cured. But at least now you can keep playing this game after beating it if you really want to and do some of the extra dungeons. As for the guide itself, overall it was good since having the conditions laid out to reach each new area was very useful and it did give some good tips. But strategy guides as a whole don't really work too well for a game like Mystery Dungeon. They definitely work better for the main series Pokemon games, where things are a bit more open and not as straightforward, but that of course isn't this guide's fault. Also, all of the dungeons being random makes it pretty hard to write a guide. Let me know in the comments down below what other game you want to see me do a video on next. Leave a like and subscribe if you enjoyed. Thank you all so much for watching. Hope you have a great rest of your day. And in the words of our great Guildmaster Wigglytuff, remember, smiles go for miles.